Welcome to the first of my series on literature in the English canon. The purpose of this course will become apparent as we go through, but essentially this is a great chance for somebody who's considering perhaps an English degree um, to learn from somebody who has an English degree, who's completed one with honors, or for somebody who likes to read, or they like classical literature, or they just like a good story told well. And I think that's essentially what literature comes down to, is a good story told well, or as Cicero might say, it's a piece of work that does three things, teach, delight, and move. In fact, Cicero was referring not to literature, but rather to oration, to speech, to rhetoric, he would say. And so that will become my goal as, uh, I guess, instructor or teacher, to see if I can teach delight and move as I go through these works. Now, this will be the um, one of the most uh, produced, you could say, uh, pieces. And what I mean by that is, um, I'm going to put in some effort into editing, and hopefully, um, as I read this, I'll put the poem's words to my, uh, to my left, or your right. Now, I'm going to go over the learning outcomes. Sound very much like a uh, teacher now. But I did have some goals when I set out to make this. Um, I started thinking about doing this in August of 2021. It is now October of 2021. Um, I didn't get us to start because of a move, but let's continue. The goals of this course are to, ha to have all the tools needed to... Um, to look at a piece of literature and pick it apart. Uh, the word I tend to use is to criticize or uh, judge it, but other people like to use the term analysis to analyze. Um, literary criticism is big on the rise nowadays, and that's more or less the ability to take an external framework, a criticism, and our critical approach and impose it onto the text and see what gets revealed. Um, we will, to differentiate this from, say, a high school course or as some other undirected analysis of literature, I'm going to um, take two approaches. The first is that um, we will analyze every text, especially if it's narrative, from a structuralist, um, you could say Aristotelian or especially Freyian perspective. And what that essentially means is we're going to decide which of the four genres it's in um, and what mode the protagonist and most of the characters are. And I'll explain that later. But just keep in mind that there are really only two genres and two more side genres, giving us four. And that is anything with a good or resolved ending, that's a comedy. Anything with a, um, a bad ending, where the main character dies, gets exiled, or goes insane, is a tragedy. Now there are also two modes in between. There's the middle ending, where it's neither good nor bad. Uh, the, you know, the ones that make you think, as people say. These are called ironies. They are very popular uh, nowadays. They weren't so popular in the past. And the other is, comedy is a reintegration of, of the main characters with society. It usually ends in a big party or a wedding. However, what is also more um, common, especially since the medieval time, but also in our modern day, 
because comedies are usually actually um, you the main characters are generally two lovers and they're separated by society the romance or the adventure story which you could consider to be um, the more literary or scholarly term for the hero's journey that's the adventure story we call it the romance now that might get confusing comedies are not funny uh, they're romantic and romances are not romantic they're adventurous but romance used to mean adventure it was the that was just another term for it so that's one thing the other thing is we'll hopefully be able to point out literary devices and i'll define them as we go along as they come up in the texts and so with these two approaches you will be able to uh, pick apart which of the four genres your piece is in um, i'll talk about the different um, elevations of characters later and what sorts of literary devices the writers we talk about are using so anybody who follows my vlog will know that i have been preparing for a ben johnson course or video for a very long time in fact this first video is uh technically part of the vlog although i won't put it in the title i'll put it in the description um and i want to kick off right off the bat with a reading of one of his most popular poems um, ever. But before we do that, I'm going to give a very brief introduction of Ben Johnson, who he was, and what his life goals are, and why we're covering him first. Ben Johnson lived around the end of William Shakespeare's life. I'm pretty sure they knew each other, and Ben Johnson, one of his life goals was to become the successor to William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare is something of a rags to riches story. I don't know if he was low class, but he was certainly around the middle and definitely not aristocracy. Ben Johnson is the same. He was born to um, a woman in the lower class. His father died when he was young, and then his stepfather was a bricklayer, and he took on the trade for a short period of time until he um, he got a decent education um, at quite a prestigious school. I don't quite remember which it is. Um, I'll tell you later. And um, he spent his life trying to become the successor to Shakespeare. And if you look at, um, I believe it's Dryden, John Dryden? I don't know, but Dryden, the poet, the writer, he wrote an essay comparing Ben Jonson to Shakespeare, and he said Shakespeare was the more clever of the two, but Ben Jonson took the comedic and actually the funny, the satirical uh, genre, the satirical mode, to an elevated position, because that was kind of his specialty, whereas um, Shakespeare was a jack-of-all-trades, Ben Jonson was very good at the biting irony, and the funny, and the comic. And like I said, comic doesn't mean funny. It means um, any story with a good ending which reintegrates society. So from one of Ben Jonson's great um, collections, The Forest, comes the poem to Penshurst. I'll give you a brief introduction of Penshurst and what the purpose of this poem is, and then we'll jump right in. Penshurst is actually a place... Um, it was owned by Sidney, who was another great poem of this time. Um, he infamously wrote, not infamously, he famously wrote um, A Defense of Poetry, which is a little essay defending poetry. Um, you may have heard the saying, poetry or fiction, you know, stories are the lie that tells the truth. This comes out of an idea that literature is lies it's it's not true it's not like history or autobiography or biography or philosophy or anything like this it's made up and so how can we learn anything from it sydney says no actually 
apart from the scenarios and the characters being made up, what it actually does is it shows us the true nature of humanity um, divorced of particularities and therefore universal and perhaps even deeper. So Sydney was brilliant and um, I don't know if it was Philip Sydney or maybe his brother or some sort of family relation who owned Penshurst. I believe Sydney was dead by the time this was written. And the purpose of this was to glorify and praise the estate and by proxy the owner of the estate in a bid to get patronage, which is basically money. That's how artists used to work back then. Um, if you were able to make a living as an artist, the primary way you were going to do that is you found an aristocrat who would pay for you to live. Like they would pay a yearly salary or a yearly wage, I guess. They just give you a bunch of money. And all you had to do was make either a painting for them or in this case a poem for them, depending on what your discipline was. So praise poetry was very common. And here this is estate poetry. To Penshurst, by Ben Jonson. Thou art not, Penshurst, built to envious show, Of touch or marble no canst boast a row, Of polished pillars or a roof of gold, Thou hast no lantern whereof tales are told, Or stair or courts, but stands in ancient pile, And these grudged at art reverence to the while. So, I'm going to pause during these. If you want an uninterrupted experience of what I'm reading, the best thing you can do is check out the notes. Um, I'm probably going to, actually, I'm going to have to make a syllabus and a textbook for this course. And that way you can, uh, if you are studious enough, which I honestly, I doubt anybody will be, but for those who are, you can check out the syllabus and read what I'm going to read beforehand, and then you will get the interruptions. But here we can see um, he's injecting a little bit of humility here. You're not Penshurst built to envious show. It, it's not a showy place. This isn't a show off. Um, it doesn't have a roof of gold. In fact, an ancient pile. Um, Pyle had a sort of different meaning. It did refer to a structure back then, but he's kind of playing down or even, um, almost insulting this estate. Um, and this kind of goes into his kind of cheeky style. Ben Johnson was a very fiery personality. Thou joyest in better marks of soil, of air, of wood, of water. So... We almost have the four elements here. Soil, earth, air, water, and wood implies fire because what do you burn to get fire? Wood, right? Therein thou art fair. So you're not any of these great things with big marble pillars and uh, gold and grand lanterns. No. You're made of these better things. This makes me look orange, huh? <laughs> You're made of better things. Soil, air, wood, and water. These pure basic elements, right? Therein thou art fair. Thou hast thy walks for health. So you can take walks on the estate. As well as sport. Thy mount, as in a mountain, to which thy dryads do resort. So now we're entering... A mythical realm, a pseudo-mythical realm, with dryads, which are um, forest spirits, where Pan and Bacchus, uh, these are Greek deities, their high feasts have made, beneath the broad beech and the chestnut shade, the taller tree which of a nut was set, at his great birth, where all the muses met. So muse is also a spirit, um, Greek again. And especially important is that the muses are associated with inspiration and poetry. Um, in the good old days of Greek poetry, in the first few lines, the poet would invoke the muse to inspire the rest of the story. Um, 
There, in the writhed, the writhed bark, are cut the names of many a sylvan, again a spirit, taken with his flames, and thence the rub, ruddy satyrs oft provoke. Sylvan nowadays uh, refers to elves, but um, it could mean anything that lives in the groves or woodlands. Uh, thence the ruddy satyrs oft provoke the lighter fawns, to reach thy lady's oak. So again, we have um, satyrs, which is a um, you know part goat, part man, fawn, part I believe deer, part man. So these mythical creatures again. Uh, Greek again. To, uh, thy cor thy thy copse too, named of gamage, thou hast there. Uh, copes is just a group of trees that never fails to serve the seasoned deer when thou wouldst feast or exercise thy friend. The lower land that to the river bends, thy sheep, thy bullocks, that's bulls, right? Kine, calves do feed. The middle grounds thy mares and horses breed. So, um, interesting that he's talking about breeding, but, um, you know, fecundity, there's life, and there's new life here. Each bank doth yield the conies and the tops. Um, a cony is a rabbit. <laughs> Fertile of wood, ashore, and Sydney's copse. The crown, thy open table, doth provide the purple pheasant with the speckled side. So he's already starting to allude to um, food and eating. And this is important because he's going to take a, a big nosedive into that subject. To crown thy open table doth provide, I just read that, the purpled pheasant with the speckled side, the painted partridge lies in every field, and for thy mess, thy lunch hall, is willing to be killed. Um, mess is like lunch, so mess hall, you might have heard. And if the high swollen midway fail thy dish, thou hast thy pawns that pay thee tribute fish. So they're not just fish for fishing, they're, they're tribute to the master. Fat aged carps that run into thy net, and pikes now weary their own kind to eat. As loth the second draught, draught or cast to stay, officiously at first themselves betray. Bright eels that emulate them and leap on land before the fisher or into his hand. This is brilliant. I love this so much that I put it into one of my own poems. But um, you can see the, the fish are eager to be caught. They're leaping onto the land or into the hand. So we've moved from a, a Greek mythologized forest to just a, a jubilant, fecund, um, very fertile and ready to give estate. And this is a reflection, meant to be a reflection of the owner of the estate, right? Then hath thy orchard fruit, thy garden flowers. And guess what's going to happen in this orchard? Fresh as the air and new as are the hours. The early cherry with the later plum. Fig, grape, quince, each in his time doth come. Quince is a sort of, um, it's a sort of fruit uh, similar to a it looks like a pear, kind of, but flat. But it's a little yellow fruit. In each in his time doth come the blushing apricot, the woolly peach. Hang on thy walls that every child may reach. And though thy walls be of the country stone, they're reared with no man's ruin, no man's groan. There's none that dwell about them, wish them down, but all come in, the farmer and the clown. And no one empty-handed to salute thy lord and lady, though they have no suit. So, this is interesting. No man's groan, no man's ruin. People work here. 
but they don't struggle here. They don't slave away. Some bring a capon, some a rural cake. So here, um, the, the, the people of the estate are giving gifts. Some nuts, some apples, some that think they make. The better cheeses bring them, or else send by their ripe daughters, whom they would commend. This way to husbands, and whose baskets bear an emblem of themselves in plum or pear. And what can this more than express their love? Add to thy free provisions far above the need of such whose liberal board doth flow with all that hospitality doth know. Where comes no guest but is allowed to eat without his fear and of thy lord's own meat, where the same beer and bread and self same wine that is his lordship's shall also be mine. So again, interesting. They eat of the Lord's own meat. You don't get second-rate food because the Lord has the best. Lord being the owner of the estate, of course. Um, no, no. You have the same meat and even the same wine. Remember, in this time especially, meat was expensive. Um, it was a luxury sort of thing. You didn't have meat every day. Maybe once a week, if you were lucky. And I not feign to sit... As some this day at great men's tables, and yet dine away. Here no man tells my cups. Uh, tells is like um, to watch or count. They're not counting how much he's drinking, how much of this perhaps expensive wine. Nor standing by, a waiter doth my gluttony envy. envy. Um, but gives me what I call, and lets me eat. He knows below he shall find plenty of meat. Thy tables hoard not up for the next day, nor when I take my lodging need I pray, pray as an ask, for fire or lights or livery. All is there, as if thou then wert mine, or I reigned here. There's nothing I can wish for, for which I stay. So, there's an alternate purpose here. Sidney was a great artist, a great poet who defended poetry. And I believe he was dead perhaps for 10 or so years when this was written. Again, I said this is written to a family member who owns the estate. But part of what Johnson is doing here is not just a praise, but he wants to claim to be the successor to um, Sidney. He wants to be the next Sidney. As I said, he wanted to be the next Shakespeare. This man has great dreams, and these were the famous um, writers of his time. And so he's sliding this in here, that um, all is there as if thou then wert mine, as if it was mine, or as if I reigned here, he says. It's very audacious. Um, I don't know how he got away with this, but you can see here, he's a little, he's almost overstepped his boundary and you know I wouldn't do that if I was in his position if I was writing this poem to get money to continue my craft I wouldn't say as if it was mine or I reigned here there's nothing I can wish for which I stay that found King James when hunting late this way with his brave son the prince they saw thy fires Shine bright on every hearth as the desires of thy penates had been set on flame to entertain them, or the country came with all their zeal to warm their welcome here. So this place is so great it entertains King James. Um, and yes, it's, I'm pretty sure it's, I don't think it's that King James, as in, um, the Christian King James Bible, but um, certainly <laughs> his ancestor, because they they had a the everybody had the same name, right? Everybody's either King James or King George or some. What great I will not say, but sudden cheer didst thou make him, and what praise was heaped on thy good lady then, who terror terror who therein reaped the just reward of her high 
Huswifry. That is a word I've never heard. Huswifry. Let's look it up. The business of housewife. Female domestic economy and skill. Oh, housewifery. Mm, interesting. To have her linen plate and all things nice. So he's even going as far as to not only mention the wife, which perhaps might have been rare, but to praise her as well. Uh, to have her linen plate and all things nigh when she was far and not in a room, but dressed as if it had expected such a guest. These, Penshurst, are thy praise, and yet not all. Thy lady's noble, fruitful, chaste withal. His children, thy great lord, may call his own, a fortune in this age, but rarely known. They are, and have been taught religion. Thence, their gentler spirits have sucked innocence. Each morn and even they are taught to pray with the whole household and may every day read in their virtuous parents noble parts the mysteries of manners arms and arts now penshurst they that will proportion thee with other edifices when they see those proud ambitious heaps and nothing else may say their lords have built but thy lord dwells so this is a such a heightened ending it, it's it's brilliant really um i almost can't even describe it properly but i focused um in my final year my first semester i wrote on this in my um my final exam i wrote on penshurst and i said I focused on this last chapter. So I'm just going to read very quickly what I wrote here. And actually, it won't be very quickly. And I might cut bits out, but I'm going to read them all and put it into the long version of this. So we're going to break the part. Um, if you wish, you can take this as an intermission, and I'll fade through black, just to be fancy. Penshurst. This is what I wrote around this time last year. Uh, it was in December during the final exams. In the 17th century, rural estates watched over the commons and served neighboring peasants. But the commons, which was common ground where anybody could uh, hunt or cut wood, were divided, fenced, and sold to be used as land for sheep and other industrial purposes. This is the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, the early Industrial Revolution. Of course, um, figures like Isaac Newton helped um, precise make uh, things like engineering and mathematics precise so that machines could eventually take over. But we're not quite there yet. Right now, we just want more pasture so that we can sell wool. I believe England was well known for its wool during this time. And during this time, the old-fashioned estates that Amelia Lanier and Ben Johnson, we might touch on Amelia Lanier, she also wrote a, an estate poem called uh, To Cookham, or Of Cookham, something. Cookham was the name of the estate she wrote to. Um, it's actually older than Ben Johnson's to Penshurst, and he might have been inspired by her work. They write about um, these old-fashioned estates that were losing economic relevancy, but still maintained a status as icons of the old-fashioned way of giving and virtue that these uh, lords had to their people, to the, uh, the peasants that lived around them. At least that's how it was in the mind of poets. The description of Cookham, that's the poem's name, shows the joys and then the loss of an old estate, whereas to Penshurst, in Johnson places Sydney's estate as supreme in both natural and moral character over the new estates. So if you remember at the beginning of this poem, um, he, he talked about all these grand estates with gold roofs and, and fancy pillars. He's actually talking about the estates of the new um, industrial 
men who are taking up the commons and turning them into pasture so they can um, shepherd sheep and get wool to make money. Whereas this estate is more humble. Like I remember we talked about how it's associated with the four elements and has a mound and um, and a river and all sorts of animals and, and uh, fruit giving tree trees. So it's supreme in both natural, as in it has a lot of nature, and moral character over the new ones. These two approaches could be read as responses to the change in political and economic backdrops of the two poets. Although in Cookham, we are not given an exact reason why, by the end of the poem, both the poet and her patroness leave the estate, which covers itself in cobwebs as they go, mourning their, uh, their exit, right? While the women were there, all the fauna served them happily, acknowledged their virtues, and even enabled religious meditation and study. In Cookham, um, they talk about how she would sit in the field or under the tree, I don't quite remember, and, and it was a great place to pray or meditate. With the mistress gone, the estate withers, as if she breathed life into it. This could be an echo of the poet's feelings on the more general societal loss of estates in the commons and the new industrial way of life. Not only is the role of the place lost, but so is the virtue and charity that the owners represented. In To Penshurst, there's a similar but more direct reaction against the changing landscape. Johnson opens the poem acknowledging the showy homes of the new rich, but contrasts their overdone display with Penshurst. Penshurst is smaller and more ancient. It is a historic pile made up of Natural base elements, wood, stone, water, and fire, represented by the wood. Um, and of course, air. I think I made a mistake here. Johnson gives the house a scene of inherent virtue due to the age and humility. It's ancient and revered. Or it's ancient and therefore should be revered. Then he moves on to the grounds of the estate, which is populated with mythical creatures like dryads and Greek deities. Shifting focus from the building alone, to Penshurst move, uh, moves on to the place's connection with nature, as well as the virtue of Lord Sidney and his family. The patron's family carries virtues, religious learning, and manners from one generation to the next. And this is this the thrust. This is why I wanted to bring in um, my uh, final exam essay. And yes, I wrote this in the period of three hours. <laughs> Um, let's reread this ending, uh, section. To these, Penshurst, are thy praise, and yet not all, thy ladies noble, fruitful, chaste withal. His children, thy lord, thy great lord, may call his own a fortune in this age, but rarely known. They are and have been taught religion. Um, you could say, uh, you know, ethics, virtue, they're good people. Thence their gentler spirits have sucked innocence. Each morn and even, and then evening, they are taught to pray. Again, nowadays, um, we're not so religious, but meditation. Prayer is a sort of meditation, by the way. Um, with the whole household. And, okay, that's, I never noticed that. But look, each morn and even, they are taught to pray with the whole household and may every day. Um, pray with the whole household. Seeing as the, how much equality and egalitarianism is occurring in this estate, it's not a stretch to say that they pray not only with maybe their parents, but with the servants, perhaps. Um, sort of humbling the Lord's children uh, to respect uh, their, uh, their serving class. Remember, this was a very classist uh, society. We're talking uh, the edge cusp of the medieval period going into the Renaissance, what we call the early modern period. Read in their virtuous parents' noble parts. So the prayer reflects their parents' nobility. They re reflect their parents' nobility. The mysteries of manners, arms, and arts. Oh, read in their parents... Oh, okay, sorry. Made a mistake, but that's fine. Read in their virtuous parents' noble parts. The, mis 
the mysteries of manners, arms, and arts. So like their parents who are intelligent and learned, and notice it says parents, not father. Um, we could do some research into Sidney and see if he educated his wife. Uh, women were typically not educated. Um, women were typically not even l very literate, um, which is quite interesting. But it did happen that occasionally um, a father or a husband or even a brother in one case um, would educate the woman, be it father's daughter, husband's wife, or a brother's sister, would educate the woman. And these women uh, tended to become very successful and very literate very quickly. In fact, once we get to the 1800s when um, women's literacy um, increases, uh, women tend to be the more literate. They, they read more than men, um, especially of fiction. And that remains true to this day. If you are intending to become a writer, just note that it's a good 60 to 70 percent of your audience is women, especially if you're writing fiction. Nonfiction, men read more a little bit, and women read fiction a little bit more. And yet, men write both a little bit more. It's very interesting how on this macro, almost cosmic um, market level, uh, we have men providing literature and women receiving it. But of course, that's probably a sexist, although Apparently true thing to say. Let's move on. They read in their virtuous parents and noble parts the mystery of manners, arms, and arts. So they learn what their parents know. And again, we have a connection. The children are noble as the parents are noble. Now Penshurst, that will proportion thee with other edifices when they see those proud, ambitious heaps. Nothing else may say their lords have built, but thy lord dwells. Again, we return to the beginning where we were comparing gaudy, gold-bedecked, marble-strewn estates to the ancient uh, grandiosity of Penshurst. The lady of the estate is virtuous and has no illegitimate children. Um, that's kind of what it means by chaste. Because chastity is associated with virginity, but when you're talking about somebody's wife, that means that she is devoted. Um, as in not adulterous. <laughs> um, her children are well taught. The strength of the family and succession implies that this estate is poised not to fade like the others, but to sustain itself into the future. And that's the importance of talking about the children. Is that This estate is going to continue into the next generation. By placing Sidney's estate as supreme in both nature and moral character over the new houses, Johnson valorizes the old estate and old way of life over the new. Cookham illustrates the sorrow of losing an estate, while Penshurst establishes a more defiant permanence. And I'm going to stop there because I made my point. I wanted to talk about the the reason why this ending is so grand and important to me is because it talks about the children and it uses the children to further praise the lord of the house but it also implies a certain staying power that that cook uh sorry that penshurst unlike the other estates with the church closing up shop and losing the comments and abandoning their peasants cookham uh, penshurst is here to stay and the children are being taught like the parents and so they will inherit the estate and treat their peasants well like the parents that's the grandness this when you go into the next generation there's a certain um certain bid towards eternity and a, a certain elevation in um in concept and and reality this is um for some people, their children are their only legacy. But of course, for Penshurst, um, there's also the estate. Now, in the long version, I'll put the rest of this essay. So if you're interested and you're watching the, the course version, um, you can hop over to the long version and continue from there. Or, if you're short on time, or just here to learn the core principles, keep watching. 
So, who exactly is this Ben Johnson, anyway? Is he a great playwright? Is he a great poet? When did he live? Who did he know? Well, we do know that not only did he know and work with Shakespeare, if you check out Shakespeare's first folio, which is in quite a famous document, especially among um, academics and, you know, playwrights, uh, actors, Shakespeare's first folio was a collection of all of Shakespeare's plays. If I'm not mistaken, it might be his only folio. Folio refers to the size of the binding, of the size of the paper. Um, most, uh, like, the way that they printed was they had a big sheet of paper, and they would fold it, and that would be a folio. If they folded it twice, that'd be a quarto, and then uh, if they folded it again, it'd be octavo, because that means that there's oct, eight pieces of paper per giant folio sheet. <clears throat> so you can see this would be probably, uh, well, you know, it might be a giant piece like this, folio. And so folio was the most expensive because it was using up the most paper. And Shakespeare, well, he ended up getting folio because he was such an important playwright. Now, Ben Jonson was not only, um, wow, stuff in my eyes. Ben Jonson wrote the poem that is in the front. And I, he might have also written the introduction, but he wrote, he contributed to Shakespeare's first folio. That's all I knew about him initially. But I learned through my university, um, or rather through um, a film I managed to find through my university's online library called uh, Ben Johnson, as published by the Films for the Humanities and Scientists, uh, sorry, Sciences in 2005. There was... Um, <clears throat> I learned that actually some of the plays that Ben Jonson made, Shakespeare either directed for or actually acted in. So there's a much deeper connection between the two. They know each other quite well. According to the Oxford Dictionary of National Biography, Ben Jonson is a poet and playwright born in 1572. June 11th, and um, they say he was born near London, and his father was a, uh, his father was cl a clergy, he was like a priest or something, um, and anybody who cares about this sort of thing, and probably he might have during his time, uh, June 11 means see that he was a Gemini, and if we follow our uh, four elements, as Seneca, the uh, Roman philosopher and Stoic, it did, it means he was an air type, and that makes sense if he was a writer, and he was also a whole lot of trouble. <clears throat> so, um, when he was young, his father died, and eventually his mother remarried a bricklayer, and <clears throat> he went to a fairly good school, but he couldn't afford to go to university, so he started bricklaying with his stepfather, and he didn't like that very much. But this is important. He is certainly a rags-to-riches story. Um, clergy are, like, just a step above the lowest class, right? Like, sorry, not the lowest class, but the lower class. Um, they're the closest thing, probably, to a, a lower middle class that you might have had during this time. And... Bricklayer is certainly a laborer, right? But what did he do? He left bricklaying and he went to fight in the army. And so he was a soldier and he brags about how he fought in single combat. That is, he fought a one-on-one -on -one fight with somebody during his time in the military. When he came back, he, um, he returned to become a playwright. He started writing plays. And 
Um, he had quite a troublesome life front to back. Um, he actually fought in a duel and killed somebody, and so he was on trial for murder. And he made a plea for... He made some sort of clerical plea. Basically, since he knew Latin and Greek from his days in high school, um, anybody who could translate scripture or Latin or translate any sort of Latin document, I'm pretty sure it's scripture though, um, could avoid the death penalty, but they have to give up everything they had and probably do some of that translation work because they had the skill, right? Um, so this is this is kind of a fascinating truth about uh, Ben Johnson. He was a bit of an angry guy. He fought people. He formerly fought people as a soldier. And then when he got home, he fought people again and got on trial for murder. But that wasn't the only brush with the law he had. Earlier than that, one of the plays he contributed to, um, which is now lost. I don't remember the name of the play. But... Um, it was found to be and against the monarch, against the... Uh, I don't remember if it was the, the Queen Elizabeth I or if the king had come into power during that time, but um, I think it was Elizabeth. He was found guilty, sentenced... Uh, sent to jail, and then I think all of the <laughs> theaters were closed because um, playwriting or and acting was considered bad now because you could make seditious or treasonous um, plays. Good job. But eventually plays did come back, and on top of that, Ben Johnson got out of jail, and lo and behold, he started writing again plays. Now, he has a few major publications. One of them is The Forest, which is a collection of um, prose, masks which is a sort of um, big, fancy, almost like a play, but it's a little, there's a little bit more involved, and it's mostly for, like, it's mostly for, like, wealthy people. Um, he really, yeah, he released The Forest. Um, he released his works, which was controversial for the very reason that, um... Ben Johnson, or sorry, works. Let's see, Ben Johnson. Works was generally a title given to a collection of like philosophical works or um, writings of a king. Like, oh, to call something the works of Ben Johnson, let's say, um, has a certain very uh, fancy and important. Uh, connotation and he was actually mocked for releasing trivial things like poetry and plays under the title of works so the forest includes our poem to Penshurst uh, which we read earlier and um, a few other things an elegy uh, it was it was one of his greater um, to him, more important collections. Um, he published his works, which included both poetry and plays, and he was trying to become the next Shakespeare. Shakespeare died during his lifetime, and he wanted to be the next great poet, uh, sorry, poet and playwright. He did achieve one of these tasks. He became called the sort of the first poet laureate. And the reason why we put that in quotes is because the station of Poet Laureate didn't actually exist when Ben Johnson got the title. It was sort of an honorary thing where he was actually paid a yearly uh, wage or salary for his position. But it hadn't gotten the title yet. So he's actually being paid by the king, I believe, at that point. And, um... But the, the, the office of Poet Laureate didn't exist yet. So he's technically the first Poet Laureate, but he actually is the... He's before the first Poet Laureate, which is kind of interesting. 
So that's a little bit about um, Ben Johnson. Ben Johnson wrote many, many plays. Um, if you want to see a huge list, you can check out <clears throat> Wikipedia has his works written down. It's just play after play after play after play, mask after mask after mask. Um, and then his poetry. And just to give you a quick idea of what a mask is. A mask is a festive courtly entertainment that flourished in the 16th and 17th century Europe that was developed in Italy. Um, it was sort of like a pageant. It involved music, dancing, singing, acting, with elaborate stage design, lots of costumes. Um... So, it was basically made to flatter a patron, to uh, look fancy and make a rich person feel nice so that they would give you money. We talk about this, we talked about this earlier when we talked about to Pensehurst, how it was for a patron. And to be honest, um, we might scoff at this nowadays, but if you think about how artists make money in modern times, uh, the answer is they generally don't, unless they get really, really famous, uh, like maybe a comic book artist um, or a famous writer. But everybody else just can't do it as a living. Now, um, in the good old days when they were aristocrats, like good old days, when they were aristocrats, you could, um, if there was one who was interested in arts, you could um, ask them or arrange for them to become your patron, which meant that they would pay for your living expenses. And you would have to do stuff for them, which might mean write a poem for them, like Penshurst, or do a few masks for them, these uh, pageant performances. So he wrote, you know, like 30 or 40 masks. He wrote over 20 plays. And then he has his collections of poems, which are numerous. So we're going to get into some of his other poems. They're sh some of the shorter ones. Uh, we won't go back into Penshurst. Um, but he wrote, um, he wrote about some of his children who died young. And so in the next segment of this video, we're going to talk about his personal life. Um, a little bit on his marriage, and especially on the children who he wrote poems for, who didn't make it even out of uh, infancy.